Welcome to Conversations. I'm Mukhtar Darkhan. Today I'm going to talk to you about the decay of rule of law in India, the complete degeneration, the steady degeneration of the rule of law in India, especially since 2019. But before that, there are two things that you must understand. That rule of law is essential for both good governance and for democracy. If rule of law is not adhered to, then a country neither has good governance nor does it have democracy. So if you look at any indices, any uh, model of good governance, whether it's the United Nations model or the World Bank model or model advanced by academics and scholars, you will notice that one of the most important elements of good governance is rule of law. Government, government agencies, organizations, civil society institutions and people, as long as they are following the rule of law, there is order and there is stability and an opportunity for change, for development and progress. So, so as far as good governance is concerned, you could argue that it is synonymous with rule of law. Without rule of law, you cannot have good governance. And as far as democracy is concerned, again, rule of law is one of the most important elements of any democracy. Rule of law essentially means that everybody will follow the laws of the nation whether it is elected officials, whether it is police forces, whether it's judges, all of them will follow explicitly the rules and regulations and laws passed by the legislature of that country. And these rules and these laws have to be consistent with the constitution of the country. That is what we mean when we say democracy. It is not the rule of a leader. It is not rule of an ideology. It is not rule of a religion. It is the rule of law as stipulated by the principles in the Constitution and the laws that are passed by the legislature. I'm going to identify five major events in the last three, four years, which provide a shocking commentary on the decline and decay of the rule of law in India. One, the Babri Masjid Supreme Court decision in November 2019. According to many analysts and legal experts, one of the things that the Supreme Court decision does, it's nearly a thousand pages, does, it takes religious beliefs as facts. It does not contest religious beliefs. So religion becomes a foundational principle of a secular democracy. So that is something very unusual. It is like saying that we will take for granted that Jesus is the Son of God and laws will be made and laws will be executed where no evidence is needed to prove that Jesus is God or Jesus is Son of God. Can you imagine that? So that is one of the fundamental principles on the basis of which the Babri Masjid Supreme Court decision was made in which the land on which the Babri Masjid was constructed, was handed over to build a Ram temple because the court took it as a fact, even though it's a matter of faith. Number two, the, a special court completely acquitted all those who were involved in what the Supreme Court itself calls as a vandalism, the destruction of the Babri Masjid, in one of the biggest and most profound acts of vandalism in which uh, leaders and activists from one religious community destroyed a mosque, a religious place of another community. This act of vandalism, which is illegal according to the Indian laws and Indian constitution and the Supreme Court of India has said so. Everybody who was involved in it has been acquitted as if there are no culprits, even though there is a crime. Number two, the role of police in the New Delhi riots. Reports after reports from Amnesty International and other human rights groups have indicated that the police has conducted itself in a very shameful fashion. Not only have they participated in it, they have abused women, they have sexually harassed women, they have targeted Muslims, and they have failed to prosecute the main perpetrators of the riots of 2020. This is a a, a, a kind of a black mark in the police of New Delhi, uh, which is governed directly and managed directly uh, by the central government of India. The third thing that I want to point out is the police treatment of reporters. In April alone, 
for example, there is a case where the police in India have actually rounded up journalists and photographers and cameramen and uh, paraded them nude in, in police stations and posted their, stripped them of their clothes and posted pictures of them uh, in just their underwear uh, on social media and threatened others of parading them nude in the streets if they protested. How can the police meet out punishment like this and that too to media and to reporters? It, it, is, it is really shocking. And another egregious example is the way the police is harassing uh, an internationally famous uh, Indian journalist called Rana Ayub. Her property is being confiscated. She's not able to travel uh, and all under direct uh, supervision of the central government. So the use of law enforcement to harass reporters and journalists and cameramen and others who are critical of the government is a hallmark of a dictatorship. Democracies are as healthy as their media. Number four, the Kannada High Court decision, which came out in March 2022, is shocking. The very fact that they have banned hijab clearly indicates that one particular community does not have religious freedom in India anymore, at least in the state of Karnataka. And if the Supreme Court does not overturn this decision, uh, then one can argue that there is no freedom of religion in India. Yes, one community can do whatever it likes. The Hindu majority community can do whatever it likes. You can start uh, high school events uh, with Hindu religious prayers. You can do whatever you like. But Muslim women going to colleges and schools wearing a hijab is forbidden. India looks more and more like the oppressive governments in France and Turkey were when they had banned hijab. And finally, the police response to the Ram Navavi violence that took place in April 2022 there were riots because large processions of Hindu religious processions marched through Muslim majority neighborhoods, blaring music and sloganeering, which is hostile to the minority community, mocking them and abusing them. And when violence breaks out, what does the police do? The police identifies people randomly and saying that these are the culprits and goes out there and demolishes the homes. No law, no moving to the court, no judgment from the court. The police simply randomly goes, picks homes and destroys them using bulldozers. This is amazing. This is, there's nothing legal about this. And one would think that if this was a democracy, then perhaps the people whose homes were destroyed could go to courts and appeal. But apparently the courts are losing their credibility and their integrity so fast, it's amazing. India wants to be a global leader. India wants to be recognized as a democracy and respected. India wants to be in the uh, UN Security Council as a permanent member. India wants to play a role in shaping the direction of uh, the global order. If India cannot have law and order in its own boundaries, how can it be a model for the rest of the world. For those who care about India's democracy and for those countries which are looking to have long-term relations with India, need to be really concerned about the decline and decay of the rule of law in India. If it continues in the same vein, then it will be a country where every government institution is dysfunctional. Every government institution is dysfunctional. While majority Indians who are Hindus may not agree, but let me tell you this much, for at least 200 million people in India, there is no trust in the courts, there is no trust in the law enforcement agencies. India is rapidly becoming an undemocratic, authoritarian, chaotic state. And the first step towards such a future is the lack of integrity in its law enforcement institutions and the decline of the rule of law.